hopes, golden memories of pioneering spirits. Long gone, the kaleidoscope of stories, of footprints shaping this land. So I wonder and I ponder and I listen to the sounds of the first snowfall. Hours late and embers burning like sleep calls to my slumber, the chatter in my head from the news of the day is now silence. The windows of my mind are now refreshed as daybreak goes. New possibilities, not a trap to be made on snow just laid as I make my way to the marketplace ornamented by the first snowfall. of change carried her to this isle of wonder where her new nights fell and the suns were rising there she made her story with her family pioneering her own history Montreal you house a saint the crossroads of court and Egypte, freeing herself from the fetters of yesterday. She's now digging her roots high, high above her grave. Every song has a story to tell Every life has a song that can be sung so well Looking back, looking forward She lived her present time with grace Montreal, you house a saint Freeing herself from the fetters of yesterday She's now digging her roots high High above her grave Hi everyone I want to start by apologizing for the delays uh, We were going to do We're going to have an acknowledgement of territory before we begin a fundraiser. Sorry for the delays requiring technological fiddling, but Candy Rose is going to give us an acknowledgement of territory. Miigwech, thank you for being here. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. And I will hit the drumbeat four times. 
to recognize and bring our ancestors in to give us good thoughts and good ways and good healing. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you, Candy Rose, and acknowledging the traditional territory of the Algonquin peoples. Uh, my name is Elizabeth May. I represent Saanich Gulf Islands on the traditional territory of the Wasanak First Nation. I raise my hands to you and say, Haishka Siam, in Sanchothan, the language of the peoples who I'm having an honor to represent in Parliament. Now, tonight's program is a little unusual. I have never, ever, ever before started cold which is to say a whole bunch of people who haven't been drinking wine, to start asking them to give money. The money part comes before the panel part, just so you know. We're live streaming, and there's a whole bunch of people in Clive Doucette's campaign from Nova Scotia who are watching online streaming. So I want to start by saying we acknowledge the territory of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy First Nations of the Atlantic region, and to them we say, Walalan. Thank you in Mi'kmaq. And thank you for being with us online. Merci tout le monde ici dans ce uh, salon et aussi uh, en, en, en nouvelle Ecosse. So, okay, this is going to be a little weird. I mean, I admit this. I, as I said, people usually give money. There's a reason that fundraisers usually involve appies and wine first. You will have no appies and wine here tonight. There is coffee. And there's lots of good people in the room. So speaking of good people in the room, I think you all know Clive Doucette. Clive, do you want to wave a little? <laughs> Clive is a Cape Breton Acadian who has been in Ottawa a bit. And regardless of where you come from on the political spectrum, I hope you want to help us make sure Clive's campaign in Cape Breton, Canso ends up in the black. At the moment, it is neither orange nor green. It is red. <laughs> and I don't mean liberal red. It just means we have a bit of debt to get rid of. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that among our runners, because this is going to be important that you know there are runners, volunteers hand holding clipboards. Do you want to wave at everybody? Now, this is where, yay volunteers, and yay volunteer. I want to also thank uh, what I, I just called him a celebrity runner. That's hardly fair. Um, the Member of Parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith, I want to introduce Paul Manley. So we have a lot of candidates in the room. We're going to introduce the panel properly later. We're going to start as quickly as possible. That's because this is the fastest fundraiser you've ever attended. How many of you have ever been to one of the Green Party Dutch auction fundraisers before? Yes, not too many of you, but you're all poorer for it. All right, so this is the plan. Um, by the way, that was my husband put his hand up over there. That's John Kidder, former candidate, Mission Matsui Fraser Canyon. So he's been um, at a lot of my fundraisers where before we started dating, all he did was write checks, which was a, <laughs> was a good way to get to know each other. And Paul Manley put his hand up because I've done a lot of fundraisers in Nanaimo Ladysmith, and it's also, it, it, it works a treat, right, Paul? Yeah, okay. And the, the main thing is it doesn't take long because we want to get to the main reason you're here tonight, which some of you may not even know it was about trying to ask you for money. I hope some of you knew it was about asking you for money. So uh, I know in this group we're not all necessarily Green Party supporters. So I want you to take away the political notion of, who, of what party you usually support. Hold in your mind Clive Doucette. Not about party, it's about Clive. He's our friend. He's an inspirational leader. You are. You should have been mayor, just saying. And <laughs> who knows, the system to deliver people from place to place might have worked. In any case, uh, in Cape Breton, Canso, uh, Clive got a result better than any Green has ever gotten before. And it left us with some debt. 
And I don't know if this is an open secret or news to people because I'm also originally from Inverness County in Cape Breton. Well, I was from originally from the States, but my family's from Inverness County in Cape Breton since I was a teenager. And basically, people in Inverness County, we always said, we never noticed the depression because nothing changed. <laughs> so if you're fundraising, Cape Breton is not the place to go, unless you're Ellen J. McCacken and have bag men and that sort of thing. But anyway, this is a Dutch auction. On the screen over there, and your eyesight will have to be really super good to see it, but on that screen are dollar amounts, and as we raise them, we go up towards our goal, which is $15,000 from all of you right here in the room tonight, and you'll say, that's not possible. Well, it's going to happen. The other thing is, uh, it's also there is the dollar amount and the tax rebate, because the government of Canada's system for giving money back to political parties when they get donations is far more generous than if we were giving to Oxfam or Amnesty or Greenpeace. I mean, we, oh, Greenpeace isn't ter terrible. Um, any, anyway, if you're giving money to good causes, you don't get as much back as when you're giving money to political parties, because the political parties organized it that way. So. When you get to $400, that's your best rebate. That's a 75% discount. So a $400 donation costs you 100. John, I can't read all that way. If you give $1,600, what does it actually cost you? So it'll cost you $950 to give the maximum, which is $1,600. See how good that is? The other thing about this going fast and why it's a Dutch auction is that we were told when we started this gazillion years ago that in Amsterdam, when they auction off tulips, they start with the most expensive bulbs and work down. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to call out who wants to give $1,600 to the Clive Doucette deficit. I know that's not very exciting. Let's just say, who wants to give $1,600 to feel better about themselves and the fate of the world? And then you put your hand up. Then one of these runners will run to you, get your information, and run to the next person. There's no shame in no one putting their hand up at all, because I'm going to move fast, right? Fundraising is, can be painful. I don't want to dwell on it. I want to move on fast. So we're, and then we move down through the rankings, and Laura is going to introduce, enter, enter into the computer. The bar will come up. We'll see how we're doing. Okay, and what time is it now? Because I don't want to take more than 10 minutes to do the rest of this. 7.30. 7.30. We'll be done by 7.40. We're starting now. Who's prepared to put your hand up right now for $1,600 to Clive to set? One hand is up. That's one at 1600 Are you adjusting your glasses, sir, or did you just donate? Okay, <laughs> adjusting glasses. Watch your hands. Anyone else at $1,600? Okay, one at 1600 Who is prepared to give $1,400? $1,400 once. 1200 1200 once. $1,000. Uh, John, what's the tax rebate on $1,000? What does it actually cost the donor? $450 only to give $1,000 to the campaign. Any one of the 1000 Okay, going to $800. Who's prepared to give $800 to Clive Doucette? $800? What's the tax, what does it cost on $800 once you take out the tax rebate? Uh, for, it costs you $304. $304 to give $800. Okay, put me down for the $800. Someone fill out a form. Paul, put me down for $800. It's costing me $304 after taxes. Oh, oh, I see another hand up. Are you at an $800 hand up? <laughs> Clever move. Okay, good. We got two at 800, one at 1600. Moving down to $600. How many for $600 to donate to Clive Doucette? And peace and a healthy world and our children's future. Anyone at $600 for all those good things? 600 costs you 200. For $200 after taxes, anyone? 600. Moving to 500, who's gonna do 500? One, two, thank you, Ralph. Thank you in the front row. That's two at 500. $150 if you donate 500. We got two at 500, anyone else at 500? Okay, moving to 400. A $400 donation is your maximum benefit. 75% back costs you 100. I see one hand at 400, two hands at 400. Runners, get to those two people. Three hands at 400. Thank you very much. Anyone else at 400? Anyone else at 400? There's a hand at 400. Thank you. The young lady, third row from the back. 
Does everybody see? Put your hand up if you haven't seen a runner yet so they can run to you. Four at 400, have I got that right? We're now at 6,100. This is good, right? Anyone else at 400? Dropping to 300. What's the rebate on 300? It only costs you 75, I think. Cost you $75 to donate 300. Thank you, ma'am. 300 right there. Anyone else at 300? 300 once? Anyone at 200? Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hands at $200. Runners, keep your hands up till you see a runner. Run, run, run. Energy, energy, energy. Come on, people. Run, run, run. Okay, how many does that make? What's our total now, Laura? 8,200. This is good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, that was, how many hands at 200 did I say, John? Did I say nine hands at 200? Nine hands at 200. Anyone who put your hand up and hasn't seen a runner yet, can you put your hand up again so the runners will know to come to you? That's wonderful. Okay, super. Okay. And runners are running. This is great. Thank you very, very much. We're now going to drop to $100 that'll cost you $25. Who's prepared to give $100 to this? One, two, three, four, five, six at 100. Anyone else at 100? Seven, eight. Oh, thank you. Eight at 100. Anybody else at $100? I know that one of my friends who just put her hand up is poor as a church mouse, so the rest of you have no excuse at all. Anybody else at 100? There we go. 10, 11, 11 at $100. Paul, are you still running? We've got some people in the front row here. Paul, run, run, run. Front row. Two, two lovely women here. Persons. Anyone else at 100? We've got a lot of people running. What's our total now, Laura? 9,300. This is awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. And anyone, okay, we're going to drop. People who didn't see a runner yet, keep your hands up. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. Any runners looking for people to run to? There are hands up over here. Well, we definitely have to break 10,000. Are you with me? So we're going to drop to $50. $50 costs you $12. So there's one, thank you, two, three, three at 50. Anyone else at 50 who hasn't put your hand up before? Three at 50, four at 50. Anyone else at 50? Thank you so much. Four at 50 gets us really close. We're at 9,500. We take checks. We'll take Visa and Master Charge. We may give them back. We may just keep taking them because, you know. Thank you so much. I'm going to close that part now and say, by the way, if you didn't make a donation right now, and you're, if you're live streaming here, if you want to contact the Green Party website and very, very specifically say you're donating for Cape Breton Canso, and copy me on your email because these things go astray and I'll have to follow up with the national office and make sure it doesn't go somewhere else. I think, James. We are pushing that link right now so that everybody can donate. So you can donate through the link on the website, James says. The local Cape Breton Find the local Cape Breton Canso EDA. And if you're watching right now, Brian and Maria, I love you to bits. Yeah, yeah. And um, Tapalet, which is Gaelic, in case we have any Gaelic language speaker, speakers watching tonight. Wallalan, which is Mi'kmaq, as you know, before, of course you know that. Uh, merci, thank you, and all like that. So hello, Cape Breton, hello, Nova Scotia. We're now so close to $10,000. I hope some people online will take us over the top. I'm going to now turn it over to people other than me, because God knows. Come on, here. Oh, come on up and say that. Hi, I just wanted to say, and to everybody online, um, it's not just in Nova Scotia, but all the way across the country, I'm James O'Grady. I was the campaign manager for Clive. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, the fundraiser, you'll be able to donate online um, through the uh, Cape Breton Council local riding uh, on the Green Party website. If you choose Donate Locally, that will come to Clive's campaign. So you can, we're pushing that. URL right now through the uh, streaming 
video. And uh, so anyone here in the room, of course, can continue to donate. But if you're doing it online, you can donate uh, uh, through the Green Party website. Thank you. Um, are we ready to break? Yeah, I'll just say, I just want to remind everybody that the legal limit for cash donation is $20 cash. So you can always drop that at the door to help the local, cam the, the Clive's campaign with the cost of the rental of the hall tonight. Um, it is, of course, there is a loophole for people who are out of politics like me. If you meet people in a hotel lobby and they have envelopes full of cash. No, just kidding. That's not. It's not a thing. No, not going to work. So uh, very grateful to all of you. We have a very interesting, challenging discussion that's long overdue that will happen soon. I'm going to turn it over to James O'Grady or to whoever, who's, who's the, uh, or to Clive. I think it's Clive takes over next. So thanks a million. By the way, just checking, anyone who made a pledge who hasn't seen a runner yet, put up your hand. Okay, runners, we still have information that's required for this lovely person here in the second row. I think you were at 50. And I think you were, anybody, so make sure we get all your information. This is easier, I swear. This works much better than having you queue up at the end to give your info. Thanks a million. What's our total now? We are at 9,500. That's not bad. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wonder if the panelists could come up, please, and take your seats. We'll, we'll, we'll start. Alex, take your, take your seat. And, and Candy Rose, Candy Rose Freeman, if she could come up. And Angela uh, Keller Herzog. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see so many friends and, and neighbors out t today. Uh, this place is a very important place for me. Uh, my name is actually on the plaque outside. It's, uh, it's, it's one, of the, one of the nice things about being a politician for a long time, you get your name on a plaque. Uh, it's also the place my daughter got married. Uh, and uh, we had our, our, our dance together to a Nova Scotia farewell. That was, our, that, was our, that was our dance. So this is a very, very cherished place for, for me and for, of course, for the whole community. Uh, I, be, be, before I, uh, we get into the, the panel discussion, and by the way, I, I'm very honored to have to have our, our panel uh, Elizabeth uh, grew up or just down a community just about 20 kilometers from where my grandfather and father and many generations of Doucette have lived and I did too as a boy and uh, I don't think a lot of people really appreciate how important Elizabeth is it's it's a great honor for me to whenever I get the chance to be anywhere with her I always feel that I'm, I'm blessed uh, uh, you know, she started off her career as an activist, and I think she still is an activist. That's why she's here. She's not, never really a politician. And, and, and she started off at 18 taking on uh, Orange, Agent Orange, which they wanted to blanket the entire island of Cape Breton to kill some, some worms, some spruce bud worms. And she and her family paid a, a big financial price for that, but they, they succeeded. And uh, they succeeded in doing what very few people ever do in activist movements. They, they actually stopped it from ever happening. And uh, 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 I, 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 c'est n'est qu'un début, as we say in French. It was just a start for her, of course. Um, and uh, we've got Angela here from, from Ottawa. Uh, Angela was, went, ran a... Uh, I, she lives just a block away, so she's even more kind of homey than I am. And, uh, and of course, she ran a great campaign and, and uh, raised the green flag very well right across the city. And, and, and then my old colleague from council, uh, Alex Cullen. Alex and I differed from time to time, but mostly we were always on the same side. And it was a good side to be with Alex, because he, when he gets a bit in his teeth, it's hard to stop him running. So Alex, big welcome to you. Candy Rose Freeman is uh, a Aboriginal descent, and she's a local NDP activist and, and community activist. And I've had the, the great uh, enjoyment of working with her on Ralston King's campaign and Sean Menard's. Uh, she she re me immediately impressed me as somebody who, uh, who was uh, needed to get a bigger voice and a, and a bigger stage. And I had a chance today, tonight to give her that. And of course, I'm very happy that she took it and welcome Candy Rose. We're, Looking forward to what you have to say, too. Uh, 
the, the, I'd like to just, the other thing I'd like to say beside the introductions is, is how we got to be here, how you got to spend all this money and, and why I got to be here. And it, it, it's, it's, it's not very, it's a little story and it's a story of, in a way it's a story of my life. And it doesn't take long. I live in, uh, my, my family farm is, uh, is, is in, on a bluff overlooking the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And I built a house about three kilometers from where my father was born. And uh, y the storms that roll in there are now quite incredible. You can get locked in your home for weeks at a time. Uh, in April of last year, we had 800 kilometer storms. 100 kilometer storms up here, would, your life would stop because you can't get out of your car. It, the, the wind will take the door right off. And we get that commonly. A barn blew down just uh, down the road from me uh, two winters ago. Uh, the, the coastline is er eroding like you cannot believe because there's no more winter ice. Winter ice used to blanket the, the big storms, keep the, keep the, keep the sea qu calm. It now rushes in and literally the sea is brown after every storm. There's so much earth that goes away. Some, some, I'm 200 meters back. And I'm thinking to myself, and 50 feet up, and I still st get concerned about the amount of erosion that's going on. So, and, and before, just a week before we had the campaign, Hurricane Dorian struck. You know, so I, I thought to myself, and we had, we had Greta Thunberg talking about, talking about millions of people demonstrating. So I thought to myself, when, when Elizabeth and I talked, I said, you know, it'll be a tough sell in Cape Breton, but I think Cape Breton's ready for it. I wanted, I couldn't stand the idea of sitting out the election and waiting for someone else to win. I thought the Green Party was founded on climate change. Now is the time to go after this, after this thing. And that would make a big difference. I said to people at the door, send a Green candidate to Ottawa and it will change people's perception of Cape Breton. People will think differently about Cape Breton. We won't be taken for granted. Uh, and uh, it, it, you know, at first two weeks in the campaign, it really felt good. We were polling very, very well, a lot better than fourth, and uh, we, we, we still, we thought we had a chance to win. And, and then what happened? Well, one of the things is climate change was never an issue in the campaign. It never came up. I did, I did more talking about transfer payments than I did about climate change, and I brought it up when I could, but basically, people, in spite of all the storms, in spite of all the support in the press, we got a lot of support in, on all the local press for, for, the green cam, for the Green Campaign, we started to tank. And I could sense it at the door, and door after door, I could sense we were tanking, and I could sense the NDP were tanking. And why were we tanking? We were tanking because the biggest player in the election, by far, was first past the post. People were really worried about the climate denying party, the conservatives, and that's what they are. Yep. They were really worried they would come into power and they were worried that a vote for anything else but a liberal was a vote for sheer. And I had more than one people, person tell me this. And you know, my campaign manager gets a little annoyed at me when I tell this story, but in Cape Breton, we don't mince our words. If you have a good friend, the closer your friend is, the more honest he is with you. And one of my friends said, Clive, for the first time in my life, and this was true in all the polls, I didn't know how to vote for. A week before the election, I didn't know how to vote for. Two days before the election, I finally decided, it's Elizabeth or Jagmeet? Elizabeth or Jagmeet? And then I finally decided, it's going to be Jagmeet. Because he, f he was polling a bit better than we were, felt he had a better chance. He gets into the polling booth, the hand goes out, and it drifts up to the liberal because he thinks I am going to get sheer elected if I vote for, for Jagmeet or Elizabeth. And he voted liberal. And he felt kind of crappy about it, but he also felt it was the only thing he could do. And that's the power of, uh, or the dysfunction of, of, of first past the post. And you think about it, we should be running this country. 60% of the, of the electorate are progressive. We should be running the country. And they're, but right now, they're split between the Liberals, yes, the Liberals, yes, the NDP, and yes, the Greens. And as long as we're split like that, our chances of running the country are just about nil. And when you look around the world, when Greta Thunberg is saying, the focus is often on climate change, that what she's really saying is politics don't work. They don't work anywhere. 
They don't work in Australia. They don't work in Brazil. They don't work in, they don't work in the totalitarian countries like Russia. They, they don't, the only places they work in are, are the democratic countries which have proportional voting. And those are all the northern European countries, Germany, Denmark, Finland, Norway. These all have proportional voting. And when people go in to vote, they're not afraid to vote green. They're not afraid to vote labor. So what I came out of the election with was saying is that solving the in climate change crisis, and that's what it is, Thunberg is absolutely right, solving starts with solving the political crisis, because that's what we've got. We've got a political system which no longer works for the majority of people. So how do we solve it? Well, it's very clear from Mr. 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 Uh, remember, uh, uh, this is the last first past the post election for Mr. Trudeau. Well, we're never going to get that from the old parties. The old parties will never give it. It works to their advantage. They can get elected with a majority with a with no more than one out of three Canadians voting for them. So why would they give it up? And so Mr. Trudeau did what you kind of expect a, 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 a professional politician to do. Said no, going to not do this. Canadians don't really want it. Well, it's bullshit. We, we, I think we do want it. We want it, we, and we see, because we, we see places like New Zealand and Copenhagen and, and, and Sweden, that it works. So what can we do? Well, I thought to myself, the NDP had a great candidate, almost as good as the Green candidate in, in Cape Breton. I really liked her. We had, had a beer together, and we talked and chatted. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, well, no one can stop us from cooperating. No, there's no one can stop the Greens and the NDP except ourselves for cooperating. And I came up, and I, I'm not saying proposing anything particular tonight. I, I think we have two things to come to terms with. One, do we want to have a brief collaboration between the NDP and, and, the, and the Greens this next election, or do we not? That's the first thing to get, get by. The second thing is, what do we want to collaborate on? I think, I think two big climate change policies would be like carbon reduction, uh, electoral reform would be proportional voting would be another another one, and the fourth would be a social justice issue like like we have in our policy, which is a guaranteed annual income for ev basic for everyone. We get rid of all this nonsense of these silos, putting people in uh, underdeveloped, you know, student silos and army silos and, and, and disabled silos. Everybody from the richest to the poorest gets their basic income. And I think it would be cheaper and fair and everyone would be a whole lot happier. Um, so, but I think that's, that's my suggestion. You may have others in, 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 in the talkback sessions, but I think we, we have to agree with one, do we want to do it? Greens and NDP across the country. This is just the start tonight. It is just the start. We're, to make this work, we're going to have to have, just like we had with Harper Man. I think Chris White's here somewhere. Chris White was, in, was one of the masterminds in Harper Man. And Harper Man swept the country and swept Mr. Harper out of, the, of, of office. And that, that was a, just a song. Well, we've got to have a kind of a talking song from St. John's to Vancouver, like this, like we're having here tonight, where people say, you know what, we want for one election for you orange folks and you green folks to bury your political ambitions and collaborate and cooperate for the greater good. Mm. You know, it's, it's a strange thing to think of as collaboration and cooperation as a revolutionary movement. But I think it is. I think if we can, if we could, in next election, if we could find some way to cooperate for one election, we would terrify the liberals and the, and the Tories. Why? Because they know the old things that they depend upon to win would be gone. And it would signal to people across the country that there were two parties who were willing to put problems and solutions first before power. Mm -hmm. So that's all I've got to say. And, and I now there are probably many more people more eloquent than I this evening. And that first one is going to be Elizabeth May. Thanks. And how long yeah. Each, 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 each panelist has five minutes for a little discourse, yeah. and then there will be a moderated uh, little discussion, and then we'll have questions. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here. First, I, because I just extracted money from you that you weren't expecting to give, I, I want to start. Is this mic working all right? Yes. Sir. Okay. I want to start again by thanking you. It's very helpful. This is a tough one for me. I started politics as leader of the Green Party only because Stephen Harper had become prime minister, as far as I could see, by accident. And in 2005, I was so devastated, November 28th, 2005 to be precise, when the government of Canada was brought down by the NDP working with the Conservatives and the Bloc to 
to end a government that had just brought in commitments to Kyoto and universal child care and the Kelowna Accord. So I felt myself crushed. And for the first time in my life, I joined a political party. And it wasn't until that spring, because as, as the executive director of Sierra Club, I couldn't join a political party and keep my job. So I quit my job, joined the Green Party, and then ran for leader. It's been a long road. I'm still fundamentally nonpartisan. I can tell you completely, honestly, and truthfully that, this, that democracy in Canada would be much better if political parties had never been invented. And the growth of political parties and the control of backroom spin doctors and the control in parliament by whips over the individual MPs is so anti-democratic. And I see it and I have more evidence all the time. The other thing I've observed since I became a leader of a federal political party is exactly what Clive said, but it's worse. First past the post isn't just affecting how citizens make decisions when they get in the voting booth. It's the culture of politics because first past the post is what informs one party to be the most vicious they possibly can be towards an upstart party that looks closer to them on the political spectrum. Because the fear is, if people think that party, whether you're looking at liberals or greens or anything, if people think that party is quote unquote okay, they might vote for them instead of for us and we can't have that, so we must attack them viciously. So the culture of politics that's so very unpleasant and that I hate and that we have never sunk to as Greens, I'm very proud of the fact that in 13 leaders, years that I was leader of the Green Party of Canada, we never ran a single negative ad against anyone and that we tried to cooperate. I'm proud of that. And we tried to cooperate across party lines in a number of occasions. If you want to ask me about it, I can get into it. But I, I, with the time I have available, I want to come to the conclusion, which is this. Since I first became leader of the Green Party, Elections Canada has taken even more steps to block cooperation. We were actually investigated by the RCMP after the 2015 election when local Greens in one riding decided not to run anyone in hopes of getting a non-conservative elected. Because the Elections Act requires that you not collude with another party with the goal of helping someone. So there are some obstacles that didn't exist in 2005 when I first became leader. On top of that, there's the problem, and it's deep, that under first past the post, the culture of politics is to get the other guy. Now, what's the range of cooperation that's legal? Agreeing to step back, but not endorse. Although, as I said, we were investigated by the RCMP and they ultimately concluded we hadn't colluded, but it was tense. We can, and, and that, by the way, is what happened between the progressive conservatives and the liberals in Alberta. Back in the day when Joe Clark was newly, the new leader of progressive conservatives, he'd won a by-election to be an MP in the House because Scott Bryson stepped back. Anyone remember when Joe Clark represented a Nova Scotia riding? Joe Clark ran for a seat in his, in his home province of Alberta and he wouldn't have won because the right-wing vote was split with reform and progressive conservatives. And in Edmonton, Anne McClellan was running for the Liberals, and she didn't have much of a chance because of the threat of alliance splitting with progressive conservatives, and then the Liberals couldn't win. And Anne McClellan's team and Joe Clark's team did a backroom arrangement that nobody knew about, just that they would campaign for each, for each other. So all the progressive conservatives in Edmonton campaigned for Anne McClellan, and all the liberals in, Cal in the Calgary riding for Joe Clark campaigned for Joe Clark. If that's even dicier today based on the change in the law. As well, there are other ways we can cooperate. We can do less against each other in different ridings and say we all agree and we can let our volunteers know that even though we have candidates on the ballots here and here, we're really working for so-and-so, because that was the case with Anne McClellan and Joe Clark. Each Joe Clark faced a liberal on the ballot. Liberal volunteers weren't working for that person. Ditto for Anne. The trouble is, as long as we have first past the post, the culture works against us. And I look around the world at my green colleagues, and fortunately, um, I have a lot of green colleagues around the world. And in, in the UK, for instance, uh, the, in the election before the last one, the UK Greens decided not to run in certain ridings if their presence on the ballot would help elect a conservative. It was noted in The Guardian, I didn't see it any other place, 
that Theresa May and the Conservatives getting, not getting a majority, people should thank the Greens for self-sacrificing and not running in places where had they run, the Conservatives would have won. They helped Labour win in seat after seat. The Lib Dems reciprocated and didn't run against Carolyn Lucas in Brighton Pavilion and didn't run against Molly Scott Cato in Bristol. But Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour ran so hard against Carolyn, they ran hard against Molly because they didn't want the Greens getting ahead even though they were stepping back to help Labour. Same thing happens around the world here too. Now in New Zealand, it used to be like that, daggers drawn between Labour and Greens until they got rid of first past the post. Now they have mixed member proportional. That's why Jacinda Ardern is Prime Minister of New Zealand. And that's why James Shaw, co-leader of New Zealand Greens, is Minister of Climate. And that's why New Zealand has some of the most progressive climate legislation on the planet. But I don't know if they could have done it if they hadn't gotten rid of first past the post first. So it's a chicken and egg problem. I don't like it. I'd love cooperation. I'd love peace and love and kumbaya to reign the land. But I've just been beaten up so badly in an election campaign where I got hate literature from the NDP in my own mailbox that this is a hard conversation to have. But I thank Clive for starting it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. I think we go to Alex now. Alex? Sure. So, folks, uh, I'd like, first of all, to thank Clive for providing the opportunity to talk about how to make politics work better in Canada. Most of us in this room care deeply about the issues that our country is facing and are often frustrated after working so hard to bring these issues to our neighbors and friends to have what appears to be so little impact on electing responsive governments. So tonight, I want to begin a conversation on how to better deal with the making politics work better by thinking a little bit out of the box. First, a disclaimer. I'm an NDPer, been an NDPer for 20 years. I've been a candidate twice for the NDP. I have run a number of campaigns, both federally and provincially, and been a delegate to provincial council here in Ontario. I am an NDPer. As you know, the NDP was founded nearly 60 years ago in 1961 through a merger of the CCF, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, a democratic socialist movement, and the Canadian Labour Congress. It considers itself a social democrat party. It has contested 19 elections in Canada, starting in 1962, with 19 seats and 13.6% of the vote. Today, we have 24 seats and 16% of the vote. On average, over the years, the NDP's popular vote has hovered around 16%. The NDP has held the balance of power in a number of minority governments over the years, has been able to advance some socially progressive measures as a result. But only in 2011, when Jack Layton led the NDP to official opposition, until that time, we've been a third or fourth party. Today, we are a fourth party. The NDP provincially, however, has been elected to government in six of Canada's provinces and is currently the government in BC with Green Party support. It is also the official opposition of four provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. The Green Party history is a little shorter, having been founded in 1983 on the principles of strengthening participatory democracy, nonviolence, social justice, sustainability, respect for diversity, and ecological wisdom. What's not to like, eh? It has contested 11 federal elections, attracting on average about 3% of the popular vote, reaching 6.5 in the last federal election. Not its best, but pretty damn good for, the, for its history. It's been able to elect MPs only in the last three elections. Right now, uh, a high of three MPs from the last election. The Green Party's the official opposition PEI holds a balance of power in BC. It has yet to elect a government in any province in Canada. It's worth asking, before we get into the discussion about making politics work better, what would have been the outcome in the last federal election if the NDP and Green Party ran a common slate of candidates. Currently, the combined seats of the, in the House of Commons, NDP and Green, come to 27, 24 plus 3. By combining, combining the votes received by these parties in the last election, that number would have increased by 8 for a total of 35. The combined popular vote would have reached 22.4%, which in a PR system would have been 75 MPs, just saying. 
In the last federal election, there was a lot of common ground between the NDP and the Green Party. Both ran on a platform that focused on our current climate crisis. Both supported democratic reform. Both championed a universal national public pharmacare program, basic income. These were the main pillars of both parties' platforms. You'd think that my thesis for the need for our party to collaborate to achieve these important goals might rest on these issues. But it's the need to be effective in campaigning for these goals, these mutual goals, that make my case. How so, you may ask. In the last federal election, the NDP came first in 24, second in 58 seats. The Green Party came first in three seats and second in seven. Combined, as I said, we would have had 35 seats and second in 57 for a total of 92. That's a little more than a quarter of the seats in Parliament, a big hill to climb to gain power and affect the changes we want. But that's not the biggest challenge. Our biggest challenge for both parties are in the seats where neither of us make much of an impact, the seats where our candidates receive less than 10% of the vote. For the NDP in the last election, we received less than 10% of the vote in 100 ridings. That's a nearly a third of the seats. For the Green Party, you received less than 10% of the vote in 187 ridings. That's more than half the seats in Parliament. I chose 10% as the cutoff because, as most of you know, upon receiving 10% or more of the vote, the riding associations begin to receive a financial rebate from Elections Canada. And receiving a rebate starts the process of building more effective campaigns that can better deliver our message, better promote our candidates, leading to bigger and better impacts on the voting behavior of the electorate. So what would happen if the NDP votes and the Green Party votes were combined in those ridings where both of us received less than 10% of the vote? Only 27 would fail to meet that mark. So 92% of the ridings, we'd be 10% or more, and in a position to be more effective in campaigning. If we're going to begin a conversation of how to make politics work better to achieve our mutual goals, these practicalities count. It doesn't matter what your message is if you can't reach voters. And if we're too far behind after 19 elections for the NDP, 11 elections for the Greens, to be effective if we keep doing the same thing. That's the definition of insanity, mm -hmm. doing the same thing over and over again. So it's time to think outside of the box, not just once, but to make an impact on the electorate and be more effective in getting our message about climate change, about electoral reform, about pharmacare, about basic income, to the people that I need to elect a government to put this in place. Thank you very much. You can see, you, you can see, you can see Alex made a great city councillor. Uh, the good news is his wife is one now, so uh, we, we didn't lose him entirely. I uh, missed her Kavanaugh, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think for number three, we'll go to Candy Rose Freeman. Candy? Good evening. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, Clive, for recognizing my big mouth. Um, the Creator gifted me with a big mouth, and I honor that gift. And you will be thanking me afterwards. <laughs> um, I've lived in Ottawa since 1982. Um, that was when Mary Endure was the mayor, and uh, the Shepherds of Good Hope had just started. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to interview. I, was, I, I had two small children, and they wanted to do an interview, and everybody was afraid of the CES. Well, I grew up in the system, and I was like, I'm not afraid of the system, <laughs> because I grew up in it. And I, I, I knew at that time, I was, I was by myself. I had really nobody. Um, and so I had to utilize, thank goodness, they had supports like a free soup kitchen and the Center 454, which gave out uh, vouchers. Um, I grew up in poverty. Um, I was awarded the state of California, province of Manitoba, and province of Ontario. My mother is residential school. She was born in 1931 in St. Boniface, Manitoba. When she was four and a half, her and I, her identical twin sister were separated. They never saw each other again. 
They never saw each other again. My mother um, was raised in Cardiff, Wales. She was very well educated. Uh, she um, became a research librarian. Her first language when she was brought there was Machif. That was lost. But she became a research librarian and she studied root languages. So Celtic languages and uh, Latin and uh, German high and low and all of that. So she uh, did fairly well. Um, she was 30 when she met my father, who was a Chumash man, and he was in the American uh, army. Um, and I was a result of a date rape. It was the 60s, and she married her rapist. And then he subsequently blinded her. And we were in California at that time because my father was from Santa Barbara, California. And uh, I only, I'm only telling you this because my mother, when the state took us, went to a place that she hadn't been since she was four and a half years old. And she walked up to the Manitoba legislator and she knocked on the private secretary's door. The, pri the premier happened to be Ed Schreier. Yeah. And between that time that she walked in there and about close to two years later, my brother and I, she won against the state of California with the help of the NDP. I am a dyed-in-the-wool socialist and I bleed orange. <laughs> um, I have been doing this. I recognize growing up in the system, always struggling um, to try to do better. Um, I have an eighth grade education. I was invited by the Manitoba school system not to return um, because I don't like bullies and um, I didn't have any fear. So um, I, I was emotionally dysregulated most of my life. Um, it turns out that I suffer from something called premenstrual dysphoria. And this is caused because of the um, endocrine disruptors in the system. Um, I, myself, have been working on this and learning about it for 30 years when nobody was talking about it, doctors telling me it was in my head, telling me that I had eating disorders, telling me, telling me, telling me. And I was insane. I was lucky if I had five days of sanity in a year. Um, so my whole adult life has been coming back from the trauma. Um, there was more, and that's for another time, and the book will be out in a couple of years. <laughs> But um, when I came up here and, and Mary and Dewar uh, asked me a couple of key questions, she said, uh, who's, who's, who, uh, did you grow up here? And she asked me some questions and I gave her my little blah that I just told you. And she looked at me right in the eyeballs and said, we need people like you here. We need people like you who are willing to stand up. And it's taken a lot of years. I've lived here again since 1982. Um, I'm now 56 years old, and I honor that gift that the Creator gave me. I do activism for homelessness. I found myself homeless at 40 through no fault of my own. Uh, my partner of nine years and I broke up. Um, it was a 0 0.2 vacancy rate, and I was on disability, and we're allowed, I wasn't allowed to own anything, which is when I really started doing my activism in earnest. Now, what I've discovered in this time of doing this activism and looking at um, all of the, the different things. First past to post does not work. We have the libcons, and I'm gonna call them that because I'm bunching them together, because we have the conservatives who deny climate change. We have the, the liberals who run like NDP, who sound like NDP, but are actually conservative. Uh -huh. And that's the truth because the proof is in the policies. And these policies are harmful. We need to, I, I, I really have been so, I've had a big struggle because I believe in voting, but trying to get our First Nations brothers and sisters to trust the government enough to vote is a big time challenge. In any oppressed society, we have something called lateral violence. And that is, it's the government stoked that fire, but we keep adding stuff to it. Now I need to speak to this, because we need, we have 45% of the electorate that doesn't bother voting. 
That's something we can do something about. Why aren't we teaching civics in grade one? Why aren't we teaching six-year-olds six that the most important position in government is that of citizen, and it requires something? And when children build things, they don't break them. When they know they're valued, they don't fall apart. They don't suicide. We don't publish, publish suicides. And it's one of the biggest killers of youth in this country. It's a shameful, shameful, shameful thing that we can prevent. This is doable. Let's talk about food insecurity. If people knew what the government allowed in our food, they'd be up there at that hill with pitchforks and torches. And that's the truth. And you know it. Greta Thunberg. God bless her. She's on the spectrum. Had I been diagnosed, I probably would have been. But the reality is, people need to hear. We are connected. We are part of the circle. We have the seven sacred teachings. They are individual governance. governance. Individual governance. We are all in this together. We must help one another. There is no excuse, and we know it on a gut root level, all of us, every single one of us. And we have to help one another. And that starts at the basics, education. We have enough to go around. We can provide education. People shouldn't be, I mean, I would love to go back to school. I'm finally in a position where I'm mentally well enough to do that. But I'm not going to incur certain debt at 56 years old. That's insane. And the reality is, is that we have enough to go around. There's enough people, but we have to hold people to account. These two parties, majorly, that have been running, and I have to say thank you, Elizabeth May, because when, when the climate uh, change issues started coming up, Nobody believed you, and you hung in there, and you turned the ridicule to fact. And that took balls. Well, the, part of the, the, the fact of the matter is, you can't eat money, you can't drink money, and you can't breathe money. And this is all happening out of basic greed. And you know it. And we know it. Across Canada, I'm talking to you. Please, my brothers and sisters, if we need to do a combined Indigenous party, fine. But we need to understand and we need to make sure that we're not doing this supremacy policies. That's what's happened. We're in this together. So are we going to be a circle and have true equality? Or is that just lip service? I thank you for my time. It's an honor to be here. You know, you know what? I, when I phoned Candy up to ask her to uh, to speak, uh, she said, "Well, nobody knows me. Are you sure you got the right person?" And I think a lot of people across Canada today are going to know you and know that I did the right thing. I did the right thing. And uh, which, which, takes, which takes me to my neighbor, Angela Keller Herzog. Uh, you know, when people talk to me in Cape Breton about why I wasn't running in Ottawa and down in Cape Breton, it didn't happen much, to be honest. Uh, they see me as, and I feel, I feel I'm, I'm Cape Bretoner down on my, my, my toes. But I said, in Ottawa Centre has more good candidates than you could possibly imagine. And I know at least two which should be members of parliament, and under a proportional representation system, I know one of them is sitting right beside me. <laughs> Angela? Thanks very much, Clive. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so these are hard acts to follow over here. Um, I'm here because of winter. Winter is coming. No, winter is here. Winter loot is coming, right? Um, Baldinej is coming. Some of you came here on skates. Um, so Joanne Roberts called me last week and said, winter storm, 
is coming to Halifax, and I need to be in Halifax to launch the Green Leadership Contest. So she asked me to be here on this panel. So I'm sorry if some of you are um, regretful that she's not here because she was on the poster at first. And I also, disclaimer, I don't represent all of the Green Party position. Um, it doesn't surprise me that so many of you have come out here um, this Saturday night. Um, during the 2019 federal campaign, I talked to thousands of households, and very often the question was raised, please, I'm torn between the Greens and the NDP. What's the difference between the platforms? Why should I vote for one or the other? And from a strategic voting perspective, how does it all shake out? That was a very, very common um, conversation. So then, when in the last week before the election, essentially the Green and the NDP vote collapsed because of strategic voting, because people were afraid that Scheer could, after all, get a majority, and that the remedy to that was to vote Liberal, it was very disappointing. And to be honest with you, I think that Emily Taman and myself were both very disappointed with the electoral outcome because we had talked to so many households who knew that it was time for climate action, who knew that it was time to step up on equity, which has been getting worse and worse and worse. So here, here we are. Um, and I think we have two problems. The current first-past-the-post electoral system results in millions of Canadian votes not counting, not being reflected in the number of seats in Parliament. And Alex has spoken to some of the numbers on that. And people do want their vote to count. The second problem is that the current system pits the progressive parties against each other, especially the Greens and the NDP. And Elizabeth just spoke to that, and how it can get vicious, um, especially as our two parties get more successful. So then the question is, how do we work together for a more fair and democratic electoral system? The answer, one answer could be that we should all support Fair Vote Canada. They have thought long and hard about electoral reform, so let's all sign their petition. And there is a Fair Vote Canada petition going around. Where is it right now? OK, it's back here. Rael Laverne has had three clipboards. So let's leave one of those petitions at the sign-in table. Those of you guys that haven't signed yet can, can do that. Picture? Yeah. There's also uh, Paul Manley is sponsoring a parliamentary petition that's available online. If you go to ourcommons.ca, there's an online petition to force having a National Citizens Assembly to take up the cause of electoral reform once again. Sorry for that little plug. Sorry, Angela. Yeah. And the NDP. And the NDP. Thank you. Uh, we're all strongly, strongly behind this agenda. So another answer on how we can cooperate is let's work together on issues, especially locally. Let's work on affordable housing. I see Joel Harden, I see Emily Taman, I see the, all the municipal councillors that are progressive, and we're all pulling in the same direction. Let's work on demanding the responsible management of nuclear waste, an issue that concerns all residents of the Uta Way. And there is a petition, one copy's over there, and there's another petition at the sign-in table now. I would ask many of you, if you have an extra two minutes, to sign that petition, and Elizabeth can take that into the House. It's a parliamentary petition, and we do not have adequate legislation on the nuclear decommissioning and nuclear waste disposal issues. And there is no question that locally, the NDP and the Greens both stand shoulder to shoulder on that issue. But you know, the much bigger and more urgent problem that we have in my mind is the climate breakdown. And the problem is so much bigger than tinkering with petty partisanship parameters. We just have to get over it somehow. Electoral politics divides people by design. But we live in a times where we cannot afford to be divided. 
there has to, there is a climate emergency and we somehow have to come together to act because we know that the two old parties are never going to implement PR and they're never going to take resolute climate action where they cancel all the fossil subsidies, where they leave the fossil fuels in the ground, where they stop the expansion of tar sands. Let's, let's be realistic. The change has to come from the progressive side. It has to come from the Greens and the NDP, possibly with help from the bloc. So how do we work together so we can get more power to be able to change the system? And this is a really complex question once you get into the weeds, because things are not the same in the West as they are in the East, including NDP-Green relations. Things are not the same in ridings where we're running third and fourth, like in Cape Breton, Canso, or where we're running second and fourth, like here in Ottawa Centre. We need to identify liberal NDP-Green strategic ridings where we can beat the liberals by working together. We need to find solutions that are democratic and fair because we can't have headquarters of the parties deciding things without a voice from the voters, from the members, from the grassroots. We need solutions that benefit both parties for the cooperation. And we need to play within the rules, the rules of Election Canada, and the rules of our parties and their constitutions and bylaws. So finding these solutions needs to happen between elections, mm -hmm. like now. And Clive is saying that we should start this conversation, we should start thinking, we should start talking about it. For me, this is not about a merger. And I would not support an option where voters do not have an electoral choice that is anchored on resolute climate action. I definitely would not want to risk Greens losing our political identity, and I definitely would not want Canadian voters not to have a green option to exercise in one way or another. But within these framing considerations, I do think that in these very, very troubling times, we need to work together and not against each other and find a way forward. I, th I think, is, is this working by the way? Yes. This yes. Uh, microphone? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we were very lucky today. We had four really, really excellent speakers and I, I, I thank them all. I thank you. Um, you know, the thing is, uh, to be clear, because you can't say anything you want to say in, in one evening, but I firmly believe we need to have independent parties. This is, this is, I'm talking about a, a cooperation for one election around in an, an emergency situation. We need the NDP to remain the NDP. They are an honorable and, and wonderful party who've been just absolutely key to so many social justice issues. So I would hate, I want to see that orange flag around for a very long time. And, and as for my, my, my green allegiances, the Green Party's going nowhere. We're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger because climate change is going to get more and more and more pressing. So we need both parties, independent identities, independent agendas, but for one election, we need to figure out a way to cooperate so we get to where we want to go, which is a, a solving the climate change problem and bringing more social justice to us. And we can't do that right now as Alex said very clearly, we've been doing the same thing now for eight, nine, and 22 years, and we're not getting anywhere. That popular vote is not shifting. So that said, I want to turn it over to you and have you ask uh, us questions and uh, so that we have enough time to buy all those wonderful books by Clive Doucette sitting over there in the corner. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so please, come forward. Madam Thomas. Is this thing on? Yep. Yes. Is, this on? Oh, is it on? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Ute Thomas. Uh, I'm originally from Germany. I've lived in Canada for over 50 years. Um, and I have, uh, for most of these years, uh, I've been a lefty all my life. I remember vi vigorous discussions with my parents when I was young. Um, I have supported the NDP for most of the 50 years I was here. And I've worked actively on quite a few of their campaigns. 
uh, I'm not a member of the party. Uh, I sense tremendous resistance among the NDP to this idea of uh, cooperation. Although, in my opinion, this is a, an essential question that this party and the Green Party have to resolve. Um, the, it is very clear that neither of the Green Party or the NDP can possibly uh, make a breakthrough electorally without a change in the electoral system. And we cannot get a change in the electoral system unless we get more seats for these parties. So cooperation is the clear uh, road to this. My question is, where does the resistance in the NDP come from? And to Elizabeth May, uh, have you speak, spoken to Jagmeet Singh and other key people in the, Liberal, in, in the NDP to find out where there could be room for adjustment and a change of heart? And how, what can we as individual voters do to mm -hmm. influence the opinion of these people? So on the, on the NDP. So, so in, in the last federal election, I was a campaign manager in Kanata Carleton. And in Kanata Carleton, our NDP candidate in 2015 got 4,300 votes. In this election, because I, I like to think because I helped, we got up over 8,000 votes. And um, we would go to all candidates' meetings. The Green candidate would be there, very nice person, Dr. Jennifer Purdy. And I would talk to their team, they would talk to us. We're in Canada Carleton, there's a big fight between the Liberals and Conservatives. It's such a small pool dealing with progressives, can we not work together? So we got 12% of the vote, and she got 6% of the vote. So work through the practicalities. I mentioned earlier that there's 100 ridings, the NDP got less than 10%. There's 187 ridings where the Greens got less than 10%. The Greens have been around since 1983 and the NDP since 1962. These are not new parties anymore. The message has been out there, tried, flagged, promoted many different times. In all of the 338 ridings in Canada, the NDP are ahead of the Greens in 314. The Greens are ahead of the NDP in 24. So when we talk talking about collaboration, I agree about the goal. What is the purpose? The purpose is to get a government that's responsive to the climate crisis, get a government that'll do democratic reform, get a government that'll do those social things that we as both members of the party support. So you have to think it through, right? Think it through. How do you get these parties to work together? You heard the obstacles here. I think the solution is a Green Democratic Party. Green Democratic Party. Th thank you very much, Alex. And I would say to my NDP friends out there that I've been writing about this in the newspapers like the Toronto Star and Halifax Toronto Health, and one of the reactions I'm getting back is they want, a, they want a new party. And I say, no, no, for God's sake, let's not spend all that time having a new party. But unless we can find a way to cooperate, I'm telling you right now, like Cassandra, we're going to get a new party and we're going to be fractured worse than we are today. Can, Elizabeth? I'll, I'll respond to the question. Is it Juta, your name? Yeah. Uh, Don Cushion. I've I have spoken, my very first opportunity to speak face to face with Jagmeet Singh. He was sitting in the, in the gallery because he had not yet won a seat. And I went up to shake his hand and I said to him immediately, if you ever want to talk about cooperation, I'd like to talk to you about it. He's never wanted to talk about cooperation, but I approached him again when my friend Kennedy Stewart, and of course Kennedy and I were arrested together, which, which tends to bring you closer together, <laughs> uh, when we were staying there at, the, at Kinder Morgan Gates, and then Kennedy stepped down as an NDP MP and is now, as you all know, mayor of Vancouver. But that created the by-election in Burnaby South. And I looked at the numbers, and I thought there's a very real chance that Jagmeet Singh will not win this seat if we run a candidate. Because Greens are strong in Burnaby South. Because of the pipeline fight, Greens are strong in Burnaby South. So I 
talk to my counsel. By the way, the president of the Green Party of Canada is here tonight. I don't know if you know Jean-Luc Cook, but he's actually president of the Green Party of Canada over there working with James and doing the numbers and the corn... Uh, wait, wave, Jean-Luc, I'm introducing you. Jean-Luc Cook is president of the Green Party of Canada. So we went to the federal council. The, the Greens are different from other parties in that we actually are run by a democratically elected council. The leader has no powers other than appointing a shadow cabinet. That's, that's the extent of what a Green leader can do. Uh, and we don't sign the nomination papers either. There's a rule against Greens refusing, to, uh, a Green leader doesn't have the, auto, the unilateral power to decide that candidate isn't running, I have a favorite, I'm gonna dump that person and run that person. I could go on and on about the differences between the parties in structural terms. But I had to go to federal council and say, look, I would like to offer Jagmeet Singh that we would extend a leader's courtesy agreement to Burnaby South, because if we run in that by-election, he might not win, and it's the right thing to do that the leader of a party as important in Canadian political landscape as the NDP should have their leader in the House. So it was extraordinary to me how quickly, because we work by consensus, not by voting. The whole council agreed. That's a good idea. It's the right thing to do. So I approached him first, because the, the NDP has actually never extended a leader's courtesy agreement to any other party. But over the years, there's a lot of history of leaders' courtesy agreement. Liberals didn't run against Stephen Harper the first time he ran, or against Stockwell Day. So, I mean, there's a lot of history. I won't go through it all. And the conservatives sometimes have stepped back for other... So I, I went, I, I contacted him. We had a good conversation. He said, we're prepared not to run anyone in Barnaby South. I want to know ahead of time if you'll accept this, because I thought it would look kind of bad for us if we said we're prepared to offer leaders courtesy, and they threw it back in our face and said, you're only saying that because you know you're going to lose, or something mean. So I first of all made sure he was going to say, yeah. so we went through down this road where Green stepped back. If we had run, I don't know that he would have won that by-election. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't have, but I thought it set the basis for cooperation in the election campaign. It obviously didn't. In Ottawa, you wouldn't know how vicious it was on Vancouver Island. But we received, as I said in my own mailbox, Paul Manley's writing. I have a friend in Nanaimo who went away for 10 days, and when he came home, there were seven different pieces of attack literature against Greens, full color mail brochures, wrap around newspapers saying the Greens would, are conservatives and would cut social spending to balance the budget. There's zero evidence for that in anything we've ever said, but it was a full color paid mailer. I mean, there's a lot of them. I won't go through all of them. So it was pretty, pretty punishing. I, I, I got to hear over the airwaves in my car on the radio attack ads with this sinister voiceover saying, if you vote green, you don't know what you'll get. Elizabeth May wants to support the conservatives. That's right. Stephen Harper's conservatives. I, mean, I heard this nonstop. That's why it's memorized in my head. They spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on Vancouver Island. And I tell you, I've had friends in the NDP caucus say to me, we should be so grateful to Greens for not running against Jagmeet in Burnaby South. We shouldn't run anyone against you in Saanich Gulf Islands. And I said, oh, no, no, it wasn't a quid pro quo. I don't expect anything back from the NDP. It was just the right thing to do. So here we are. I can't answer your question. We offered that we want to cooperate. We proved it by helping Jagmeet win a seat. And in return, we lost a seat in Victoria that we were ahead for an indigenous woman of real power, a voice that should be heard in parliament. She lost because of lies that were spread through the media and paid advertising. Now that's just one campaign. It doesn't mean we couldn't get it right and do what Clive wants to do in the next. But I can't answer the question, why don't the NDP cooperate? I can just tell you, did I ask? Yes. Did I offer? Yes. Did we prove it? Yes. Were we punished for it? Yeah. I wouldn't say punish for it. Oh, yeah, we in, lost three seats. In Burnaby South, the Greens did run a candidate against Jagmeet Singh. No, we didn't. Yes, you did. Not in the by-election. I'm talking say, about the by-election. I didn't by -election. say the by-election. In the last federal election, yeah. there was a Green Party candidate. And what did that Green Party candidate get in Burnaby South? 5.5%. We put no money in that Wake campaign. Up, we did, Alex, we didn't help There's that candidate. 187 oh, oh, ridings. Thank you, Alex. Less than 10%. What is your future? What is our future? What would have okay, happened okay, in the okay, by-election, okay. Alex? That's unfair. 
unfair and misleading. We did not do anything to assist the candidate in Burnaby South. There were candidates campaigns we worked really hard. The referee that wasn't here, one. And we did not run intervene. anyone in the by-election. The referee is going to intervene. You both are going to the penalty box for two minutes. <laughs> so that's it. But, uh, and I, whoa. Uh, so, uh, yeah, question. another question, please. Yeah, I'm Jill Vickers. I ran in the 1970s in Ottawa Carleton for the NDP. Um, since then, and having learned firsthand what the electoral system does to people, and you've seen an example of it, uh, we've all lived it, whether we've run for office or not, the electoral system is a pernicious, creates a pernicious culture. And it's not simply that it creates a pernicious culture, the legal situation makes cooperation extremely difficult. And you can't, through cooperation, change the system in one election. I'm sorry, you simply can't. You just work, do the math. Alec Calden gave us the math. It would take at least three elections, and that was what we learned from New Zealand. It would take at least three elections if we had a complete agreement that we would cooperate, and it was basically uh, honored um, at the party level and at the local level, which is extremely difficult to achieve. Um, there's some good research on it, and I would recommend reading it before um, assuming that changes can be made quickly. There is one way that you can make change quickly, and that's through the courts. As a citizen, my vote doesn't count because I vote for a party that is ruled out. Many of you are in exactly the same position. We are disenfranchised by this electoral system. So if we wanted to combine some cooperation, because it would take a couple of parties to be a party to a constitutional challenge, but it would also take a large number of citizens to fund a constitutional challenge. That is the only way it could be done with reasonable, say in 10 years, it would take 10 years, but uh, it certainly would have a more likely satisfactory outcome than trying to undo uh, 30, 40, 50, 100 years of a very pernicious uh, electoral culture. Uh, thank you. I, I think we're going to go straight to a number of speakers, so because we're running out of time and we've got a lot of speakers and we've heard quite a bit from our panel. So unless you've got a really searing question, you'd like to make just a statement, make your statement, please. Um, uh, a small question, but also a statement. Um, my name is Carl Steeren. I'm, uh, I'm a Quaker and a member of the NDP. Thanks. Closer, closer, closer to the closer? microphone, please. Even closer, there's echo from here. There's no echo there? No. Nope. Okay, okay, good. good. That's good. I'd, I would sincerely hope we could find cooperation among a limited number of candidates in the next federal election, maybe 24 seats. 24 ridings for 24 ridings, and maybe we could even make this more nonpartisan by letting somebody like the publisher of Now Magazine, who, op who did a survey and, and recommendation for strategic voting to keep the conservatives from winning uh, two elections ago, uh, to identify those seats possibly and do a, a, a number for a number split where we could obey the law. Elizabeth can tell you if, if there's a way, could tell us, could you tell us there's a way we can keep from disobeying the law but still get the effect of co cooperation. And I think that's the only way we're going to get ahead. And if that works, then maybe the next election we can do a little bit more and it will take time before we can implement this all the way. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't think we've got a lot of time. Next, next person. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Um, my name is Gillian Kirkland, and I'm here on behalf of a newly formed citizens group for collaboration between Green Party and NDP. We had our first meeting a month ago, and we have our next meeting on the 11th at 7 p.m. at the Parc Jules Morin Fieldhouse. For any local people who are interested in discussing this further, we have so far uh, created a Facebook page and drafted a mission statement, and we're looking at specifics um, 
in terms of what's going to be the best kind of collaboration. But we're a group of people from NDP, Green Party, and Fair Vote Canada. So could you, hold on, before you run away, could you make? You, could you say what your group is again? I don't think a lot. Of people <laughs> we're we're it. working on it. <laughs> we, we had a long debate about what's the the title of the group. Right now, it's called the Green NDP Working Group. But the, the focus is electoral reform, and, and we're discussing to what degree a, a tight-knit collaboration or a very targeted collaboration would be effective. So if anyone's interested um, in being more involved, feel free to come talk to me afterwards, and we have some other members here, too. It's, it's a work in progress. It just so happens that it's timed perfectly with this well, event. So. Well, uh, wow, this is serendipitous, yeah. but yeah. wonderful. Really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ray Levering. I'm with Fair Vote Canada. I'm actually part of this group with Gillian. And she forgot to mention that she brought a number of copies of our vision statement. And so if people are interested, you could ask her for that. I think you'd find that useful. Um, one of the things that I think has changed with the 2019 election um, is the way the numbers shook out. I can imagine how before 2019, the NDP was riding pretty high for a while, probably thought they could do a lot better. But when you actually look at the numbers, and Alex, you gave us a lot of numbers, one you didn't give us was the way votes translated into seats in this election. And frankly, both the NDP and the Greens were massacred. Uh, the NDP got 16% of the vote. They got 7% of the seats, less than half what they deserved. Of course, the Greens, well, it was the usual thing, except they got 6.5% this time, which sounded pretty good. They only still got less than 1% of the seats. Mm -hmm. Makes you feel any better, uh, Elizabeth. In uh, Australia, the Greens get 10% of the vote and they get one seat. Oh, I know. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there's that threshold with first past the post, and it's just going to keep happening. Yep. And with both the NDP and the Greens having been hit so bad in 2019, I think the incentive should be there to work together the next time around, even if it's just for once, because I think it would really shake things up. Uh, and, and so hope in the electorate. I think people want to vote progressive, but they're voting strategically. If they were able to vote for progressive united, um, I think their vote share would go from 22%. It could go to 30%. Well, imagine that. That's close to minority government territory. Can I think I, that would I, be possible. Real, can I say something a bit, maybe a bit unpopular here, but it hasn't been voiced, that it's really important to have people who tell the truth elected to parliament, regardless of whether they form a majority or even get to a minority. Mm -hmm. And I would rather have five, I mean, three Greens is great, five or six, even less than 12, who are resolutely calling out this is a climate emergency, yeah. who talk about real targets. I, and I know a lot of you are NDPers, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I did not hear a single policy put forward by the NDP in this election that wasn't just a little less bad than the Liberals. So just to talk about this, because <clears throat> here in Ottawa Centre, you have an MPP who is endorsed by LEAP. Are you familiar with LEAP? Very strong. Yeah climate change organization within the NDP. And I can tell you, within the NDP, many of us believe we're the original Greens. Now, I have to give credit to Elizabeth May and her party because she has made climate change front and center. She's articulate, she's smart, and she has promoted this issue, and she deserves great credit for it. But please don't think that you own that issue by yourselves. I don't want to own it. I want someone and to so, care about it. And so, within the NDP, and I can tell you, having run a campaign, having had a candidate, speaking at the all-candidate meetings, we're there as well. That's why I'm talking about a green, new Demo green Democratic Party, because we share these values on the climate. We do. If we're going to collaborate, you have to collaborate on shared values. This is one of the shared values. Alex, Let's not deny Alex, that. We, I, we have to go I did to, have a question. We have to go to a couple more speakers, but I would say the exchanges between Alex and Elizabeth are exactly the reason why we need cooperation in the next election. Exactly the reason. Both articulate, both have their points to make, and both basically not moving us forward because we're too busy saying, well, she got it right, he got it right, she got it Clive, right, he got it in right. Fairness, Clive, in fairness, we actually did extend a very generous action in the by-election. I'm not just I'm, talking about why I'm, we won't cooperate. I'm, I'm, not I'm telling that. you we've tried, and we're continually willing and open yeah. to trying. But I need to know that the voices that are elected no. from whatever party 
actually understand that we're going off fossil fuels, aren't prepared like John Horgan, who got into power telling Greens he would fight for climate action and then is throwing subsidies at Canada, at, at LNG, and at a violating on by, 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 by the Wet'suwet'en and the hereditary a chiefs. supported by the Green Party, by Not the way. Not on, the Greens have never voted for LNG, and by the, the way. That government is supported by the Green Party. So would you Party. have rather they put Christy Clark in power, Alex? Ah, so here's the balance. Angela, eh? Angela, if we want like to get to past court, tribalism Angela. here, Alex, Alex. focus on the issues that Alex. unite us, Use another not word. those that divide us. Alex. Use another word. So, so I'm going to give up my mic. How but, many uh, of you in the audience have, I'll, I'll ask it had any experience with um, mediated conflict? <laughs> So I think that the electoral system structurally creates this conflict between actually fairly like-minded parties. So, and this is about the future of our children, like our children together. So I think that we need to figure out some way of mediation where we identify a path of the joint interest. What is a win-win solution? what is a negotiated and a structured and a KG and legal path forward mm -hmm. that wouldn't be <laughs> that wouldn't be a cookie cutter because each writing is different and we have to respect also the grassroots and the democracy but I think if we can identify that shared interest to get over the conflict that that's something that strikes me, because it is for the children and the future generations. That's right. Th thank you, Angela. We're all in this together, and I there's not going to be anything less unless we stop this nonsense. Okay? What part of you can't eat money, you can't drink money, and you can't breathe money don't you get? Our Mother Earth is sick. We are connected to our Mother Earth. We are sick. Enough. Okay, it's, yes, now, indeed. it's now 10 to 10, Mother Earth tells me. And we're going to go with three more speakers, okay. just from the floor. Nothing more from the chair. From, from up. Thank God I get my chance. <laughs> okay, four speakers. Four speakers is good. Okay, thank you okay. very much. Greetings we're, to everybody we're, and to all the political leaders and everybody here. Speak, speak loud. Speak I loud. said thank you very much and greetings to all the political leaders here today and uh, all the people here. Uh, my name is Faraz al Najim and I'm a manager of a human rights organization called Canadian Defenders for Human Rights. So we work in uh, different countries to help people, like in aid campaigns and so on, and we work with different political leaders to change certain policies that we feel are unjust. So in the last elections, most of the people were, you know, that I went to go see, I saw most of the leaders of the political um, parties, uh, also Elizabeth May, Jamit Singh, and we had a lot of conversations about different situations and causes. The main point is that uh, a lot of people that I talked to were strategically voting for the bigger parties because, you know, they were scared that, you know, the, the, the smaller parties are not going to get any power. I spoke to them in a different way. I said, no, we should strategically vote for who's working for our principles and for the diversity of Canada and for world peace. And uh, we should sacrifice, but we, you know, at the end of the day, strategically also, we rely that these small parties would unite and give us a real voice. And I'm very happy to see the NDPs and the Greens uh, sitting together and uniting to have a stronger voice for us. And I think that you should put away all the differences because you have a lot of things in commonality. And this is what should unite you uh, to give us a stronger voice. Uh, th there's a lot of crises and bad things happening. You know, uh, there's tensions of war between Iran and other countries because of the American administration and their foolish moves. Um, one important thing, I know you're talking about climate change, and I'm very happy that you brought this up. It's an important cause for all of us because it will hurt us all. And this, and this like um, Mr. Candy Rose, uh, Mrs. Candy Rose was saying that it's, you know, it's impacting all of us and we should all unite because we're all interconnected. It's one world. Another crisis that we don't talk about a lot in Canada and it's not spoken even in the media is Yemen. Yemen is the biggest humanitarian yeah. crisis in the world. You know what I mean? We got humanity on the line here. It's being torn apart, you know, by one of the most cruel regimes like the Saudi regime. And Canada is supplying arms to the Saudi regime and it's the biggest weapons contract in Canadian history. Shame How? on them. Shame, Shame on, on them. them. You know? Shame on them. That is not under Canadian values. You know, I'm working, we have a team that works on the ground so we know a lot about, you know, what, the, what, what, what what's really happening there. You know, the crisis is unbelievable in Yemen. It's unbelievable. I know there's a lot of conflicts and problems in the world, but Yemen 
is something that we should care about, and we should not be selling arms to them. So we, I want to know if, like, on a united front, are you, like, since both of you commonly are against the Saudi-Canadian arms deal, how stronger are you going to, you know, push towards stopping this arms deal? Like, what are you going to do to stop this arms deal? We're selling arms to a convicted criminal. In Canada, you can't sell arms to a convicted criminal. It's illegal. So how can you be giving arms to war criminals? You know, it just doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? What, what we want for ourselves, we should want for others, right? This is, a, this is a, a basic belief. This is a basic principle. And also the Palestinian cause, other causes. I mean, we need, to, we need to work hard. We have a lot of work to do. So I mean, like, I hope that you can put your differences aside and unite for world peace. And we need to stop these wars because we have foolish people in big political you know, positions and they are causing destabilization. We just lost a lot of people in that uh, Ukrainian airline. And those are Canadian citizens. This impacts all of us. This is a pain for all of us. You know, We're suffering from this. doesn't matter what their background is. At the end of the day, look at us. We're all from different places and we're working together. We're living together. We're building businesses together. So, uh, I mean, uh, let's, let's work for world peace and let's unite uh, the Green Party and the NDP. Thank you. Thank you. Please and thank you. That, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, your comments about this crisis. Yeah. Hi. Oh. That's too far, but that's okay. Hi, thanks for this. My name is Kathleen O'Hara, and after the Liberals were knocked down to a well-deserved minority, <laughs> some of us decided that we should start a group called Climate Crisis Legislation Now, because the, with the minority government, they could be persuaded to do a few things that they didn't with the majority government. So we're trying to promote a green jobs transition bill for one thing and we're trying to get the NDP and the Greens and possibly the Bloc to push the Liberals. So what I'm saying is because we've got an opportunity now to practice cooperation, that's probably a good thing and what do you think? I mean I'd like to yes. see answer, people, yes. pra the two parties, the NDP and the, Lib and the Greens, um, allying, making a few key climate crisis demands for the budget, the federal budget. Mm -hmm. And we should come up with two or three demands and, and push the Liberals together. Why are we talking about a future election when this election came out rather well, considering? Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa. As one of the younger people in this room, um, I just I wanted to say the tension we've seen today, I think, illustrates how difficult it is to have these conversations, and it's also the way I think voters are reason why voters are disillusioned. Um, I I think yes, we need cooperation between parties, but that cooperation has to start between people, and when we see the tensions. A, a rise that we, for example, saw between Alex and Elizabeth tonight, um, that's disappointing. And I think that these conversations have to start here in this room about how we can find commonality and work together. And I think Angela's suggestion t about conflict resolution and mediation is an incredibly strong one. We, as, as young people, we, don't, we, don't, we see that we don't have the time for arguments anymore. We need to come together and find commonality now and that means having conversation with your enemy. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say is uh, more like politics-based, which is um, someone mentioned the block earlier today, and I and I think having uh, lived in Jack Layton's riding and was like so excited when the Orange Crush happened, um, the reality is that was also caused by a huge uh, disillusionment with the block. And so if we are going to actually make progress in common and finding commonalities and working uh, with these two parties together. I don't think we can leave Quebec out of the conversation, so we have to figure out how, how uh, the bloc fits into that and how Quebec fits into that, because if gains are made there, uh, I think it, we can really change the map across Canada. Thank you. I'll just pick up on that uh, cooperation theme. As an elected member of parliament, I see that it's my duty to work with others in all parties across party lines 
no matter what party they're from, on the issues that, that, uh, where those members of parliament share values with me. And it's also my duty to work with those members of parliament who don't share my values to see my values, to work with them in a respectful way, to try to bring them forward and to get them to understand the issues that are important to Canadians. I'm an orange diaper baby. So, you know, I, I had my first campaign, got chased off my first porch in seven years old, working to get Dave Barrett elected. Mm -hmm. I campaigned with Tommy Douglas to get my father elected and lived a block away from here when he was a member of parliament. I worked on every NDP campaign all my life. And uh, often, I was also protesting against my government. So in BC, I was the guy that set up the PA system on the legislature lawn, brought in the speakers, brought in the bands, and protested against the, the clear-cutting of Clackwit and the destruction of the old growth forests on Vancouver Island. And I would meet the next day with the environment minister, who was a family friend, and I would ask him, you know, why can't we protect these forests? Why, are we, why do we not have, you know, secondary industry for our, for our logs? Why are we not getting the true value out of these logs and lots of labor out of them instead of shipping them off uh, the way that we are and c cutting down thousand-year-old trees and turning them into dimensional two-by-fours and four-by-fours? And he would tell me, like, he, they're struggling in the party, and really the environmental wing of the party was never the strongest wing. I tried to run for the NDP, and I, I wasn't allowed to because I defended my father when he was on a boat to Gaza with parliamentarians from around the world and was held incommunicado for six days, and nobody would speak up for my dad. He was one of the last ones to be released because it was the, this was the only country that didn't speak for their citizen their parliamentarian to get them released. Elizabeth May spoke out for my dad. But the NDP wouldn't let me run, and I, Elizabeth asked me to run six times, and eventually uh, I said yes. <laughs> Don't wait down. And I won. And I want to tell you something, just, to, just because it's not a, this isn't a, um, an NDP voter is not a Green voter, a Green voter is not an NDP voter necessarily. Elizabeth beat a Conservative cabinet minister. Yeah. She did not take NDP votes away from an NDP candidate. And I had people working on my campaign who were former progressive conservatives and former liberals and people that you have reasonable conversations with and try not to be hyper-partisan with and you work on turning that dial, you know? It's, you're not gonna take them from here to there. You're gonna nudge them and nudge them and nudge them. And when you talk to people in a rational way about the issues we face and you talk about commonality, what is your vision for your children and your grandchildren? What is the vision for your future? What, what does social justice mean to you? What are human rights? What does that mean to you? What does equality mean to you? How can we have a better society and a better planet? You bring people towards you. And it's not about necessarily taking one from the other. It's taking from all. I had more people working on my campaign who had never worked on an election campaign in their lives and some of them had never voted before. It's about inspiring hope and it's about working together and that's what we have to do and if we don't do that... We're toast. That's right. I thank you very much, Paul. Listen, uh, I'd, like, I'd, like to, I'd like to end this evening. I, I said four speakers, that was the fourth. Uh, he was the fourth. Give a chance. Okay, okay. okay. The, the house speaks for you, sir. Well, the house speaks. Go mine's ahead. a slightly different slant. Um, I worked for um, Jim Harris. I was actually on his executive, a Green Party leader. He's a conservative. And we forget in this room, the most progressive in the environment was a conservative. The conservatives went nuts because of their base in Alberta. So I left them. I went to join the Greens on the executive, by the way, I'm delighted when Elizabeth took over. My point, but then I left the Greens. Why? Because in Don Valley West, I saw that the vote split and the Conservatives got in. The new Conservatives, the Republican Conservatives. They weren't the pro progressive Conservatives that I was reasonably comfortable with, although I didn't vote for them that often. My point that I'd like to make 
It's actually, I'm uncomfortable suggesting that the Greens join the NDP. For that matter, the Greens join the Liberals. And I think, Elizabeth, you were a Liberal. No, I've never been a member of any party ah, but the Greens. So, oh, sorry. And I've never worked in a partisan way for any party but the Greens. Ah, I stand corrected. Sorry. Okay, anyway. My point is that I decided to start campaigning with Greens, saying, look, we all know what we want. It's the environment is absolutely key for me. And so I started getting my Green friends to start working within the parties. Unfortunately, too many Greens left the Conservatives and left it to the guys that are just absolutely married to oil. Too many Greens left the Liberals, left it to them just worrying about power mongering. And thank goodness we have Greens who keep reminding them of what the heck the politicians are supposed to do in terms of making things, and this is a Jim Harris line that I always agreed with, making things sustainable, politically sustainable, environmentally sustainable, but also economically sustainable, which is why I have a, except for my youth when I was at university, have worked not with the NDP. So in closing, I would hope all Greens would look to whatever party and try to influence it from within rather than what you've seen here today, fighting each other, people who are progressive, have the same goals, and all that's going to happen is divisive politics and a core group will always get in like Donald Trump because he, all he needs is his base. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to also thank James O'Grady who was uh, instrumental in putting this night together. So a big thank you to James. I, I'd like to thank you for coming out. I'd like to thank our, 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 our panel, which has been wonderful. And I would also like to, to make a challenge to uh, folks back, back home in Sydney, Nova Scotia, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and on Vancouver Island and across the country. Have panels like this. Have discussions like this. Because I'll tell you, the only way we're going to get change is from this level up. Uh, the, from the top down, it's not going to happen. But if we have these discussions, if we get a petition going, and, and who knows, maybe, maybe the big guys and the big girls and the big parties will start to pay attention and we will bring a message of hope to people across this country because I think people want a difference. They want, to, they want to vote differently, they want a different kind of government, but they can't get it the way we're set up now. We need to change that. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Five books. Five couple of books. Good, good.